funeral in South London. A federal investigation in Brooklyn. The common link is the tobacco industry, and I'll be revealing how they've lied, deceived, and manipulated the truth for 40 years in a specially extended edition of Panorama. That's Pack of Lies on BBC One tonight at 9.30. Manhattan, December the 15th, 1953. The tobacco industry is moving fast to head off a crisis. The news is out, cigarettes cause cancer. The American tobacco bosses are about to meet in an unprecedented emergency session in New York's famous Plaza Hotel. Cigarette sales will soon plunge catastrophically unless they come up with a plan to save their industry. The top five presidents they've never met professionally before are to work out nothing less than a strategy for survival. That meeting took place 40 years ago, but the decisions taken then have remained the basis for the strategy still in use today. Indeed, it was so successful that despite overwhelming evidence that smoking kills and injures, the tobacco industry continues to flourish. Tonight's Panorama investigation asks, has the industry been telling the truth or selling a pack of lies? Roy Tripp, lung cancer caused directly by smoking has brought him to this. But the tobacco industry says the smoking and cancer relationship remain unproven and they still refuse to endorse government health warnings on cigarette packets. Yeah. Right, just check that it's in place, okay, with a little bit of salt water. You had a good weekend. I did, I didn't do very much. How about yourself? Roy Tripp is an indirect victim of the New York meeting 40 years ago, for it was there that the tobacco industry began to generate both false hope and uncertainty about smoking and health. The tactic was aimed at keeping people smoking by helping them believe they might well get away with it. Roy Tripp didn't get away with it. Cancer has robbed him of everything save his dignity and the dreadful awareness that he's been fooled. I smoked from about 69 up to I was diagnosed with cancer, which is two, two and a half years ago. What do you think of the behaviour of the tobacco companies? Well, I think they deceived us. Why? Well, they brought back information they should have passed on. One week later, Roy Tripp succumbed. Mourned by his relatives and friends, he now joins the grim legion of health statistics. Nine out of every ten people who get lung cancer get it from smoking. Roy Tripp first smoked 25 Rothmans or Marlboro, turning later to 10 Hamlet cigars a day, a habit which brought no happiness to him or his widow. Barrister Charles Hopkins pays his respects to a friend and a client who died too soon. Hopkins represents over 200 smokers who are suing the cigarette manufacturers. They've actively sought to conceal those risks from people, thus increasing the likelihood of this damage being done. Had they provided this information, a large proportion of people would not have suffered the injuries they have suffered and the injuries themselves would not have been so severe. The death in South London of Roy Tripp has its echoes here in Brooklyn 
where federal investigators are combing through the behavior of the tobacco industry over the last 40 years. The United States Attorney's Office in eastern New York is investigating the possibility that the tobacco companies may have violated several federal statutes in what amounts to a conspiracy to deceive people about the real dangers of smoking. Now, if a clear pattern emerges, the attorney may decide to bring indictments through a grand jury under the RICO statute, the Racketeering and Influence Corrupt Organizations Act. In the beginning, it all seems so harmless and fashionable. Smoking takes many years to inflict its terminal illnesses, and there simply was no evidence of the long-term effect. In the 30 years that Hollywood was setting cigarette fashions throughout the world, sales in the US alone shot up by a staggering 600%. These were the good old bad days when cigarettes equaled style and panache. It's very hard to date, realize quite what smoking meant in those days. Firstly, it was the big breaker of the social barriers. As soon as you met, you took out your silver cigarette case, or if you're really toffy you nose, know, your gold cigarette case, and your presentation of the cigarettes was vitally important, and then you lit the person's cigarette with your lighter. Of course, I'm talking here as somebody who was middle class. At the other end, you had the working man, and as a result of the war, he too was going up, and he wanted to, to do this, but he couldn't afford it. So he had weights and woodbines, where we had Doreshki, and Markovich, and Abdullah, and all these rather tough, at senior service, of course, all very toffee-nosed ones. He had fags and you had cigarettes. Yeah, that's right, it was a very big social difference. I feel very privileged to have been asked to host this dinner in celebration of Richard Gold's 80th birthday. On behalf of the, the man who shattered the cosy assumption that smoking was safe, Sir Richard Dole, tonight's guest of honour at a lavish Royal Society dinner. Forty years ago, Dole's pioneering research into the alarming increase in lung cancer detonated medical landmines when the evidence showed a clear relationship between smoking and cancer. Well, the conclusions were that uh, cigarette smoking, or smoking altogether, but particularly cigarette smoking, was the cause of about 95% of lung cancers. And then as we did the further studies in which we followed up people who smoked different amounts, we found that it was the cause of a lot of other diseases as well. Which was not surprising when you realize that there were 4,000 different chemicals in tobacco smoke. At their New York Plaza meeting, the tobacco chiefs united in a plan to regain the initiative. They jointly funded a twin track strategy, a public relations drive, and a substantial industry funded research program. A new organization, subsequently called the Council for Tobacco Research, the CTR, would be in charge. The approach was designed to reassure an anxious smoking public, and their lofty aims were publicized from coast to coast. The so-called Frank Statement to Cigarette Smokers appeared as full-page advertisements in 450 papers throughout America. We accept an interest in people's health as a basic responsibility paramount to every other consideration in our business. We always have and always will cooperate closely with those whose task it is to safeguard the public health. That was the tobacco industry's stated position 40 years ago. That is its position to this day. That was the beginning of a campaign to obscure the evidence, to try to diminish its impact, to get the public to perceive smoking as just another risk one of a multiplicity of risks in our environment and thereby to diminish the impact of this incredibly damning evidence that was available as early as 1950. A few years later, the tobacco industry conducted its own private research into smoking and ill health. They wanted to check the strength of the growing evidence against their products. Even as early as 1961, following experiments on mice, one major research laboratory reported unambiguously to the Liggett and Myers tobacco giant. There are biologically active materials in cigarette tobacco. These are cancer-causing, cancer-promoting, poisonous, stimulating, pleasurable, and flavorful. We had a pretty good idea of what these materials were in the early 60s. We had found a group of compounds that explained the activity on the mouse skin. 
And there was no doubt in your minds, uh, Liggett and Myers, that, that this was cancer-causing, these were cancer-causing compounds? There's no question about that. 10,000 people. 31,000 blueprints. R.J. Reynolds is one of the world's largest cigarette manufacturing companies and proud to promote its sheer size as part of the huge R.J.R. Nabisco Food and Cigarettes Corporation. In the 60s, it had its own biological research laboratories in North Carolina. Tobacco bill. So while it made cigarettes in one building, another was used to find out if and how the product might be killing the customer. This was the old, original uh, research department for Reynolds Tobacco Company. Uh, Joe Bumgarner worked here in Reynolds Biological Research Laboratories during the 60s. It was nicknamed the Mouse House because much of the research examined the effect of tobacco smoke on animal lungs, mainly mice and rabbits. The work we were doing at the time, we felt, was state-of-the-art, and I still feel that way. Uh, was it exciting, and did it lead anywhere? It was extremely exciting. We felt that we were on the road to making a discovery uh, of a cause-and-effect relationship between smoking and a clinically defined disease. So this was the crucial animal work in the early days, when all the warning signs pointed to a connection between cigarette smoke and ill health in humans. Although Reynolds were initially happy to fund the work, the results have never been published and have stayed a secret for a quarter of a century. Now we've obtained this confidential document which reveals that the tobacco company confirmed that smoking induced serious lung damage in animals. But at this critical stage of research, the experimental work in these buildings was ruthlessly and mysteriously shut down. A full 15 years later, Reynolds needed to forestall difficult questions about the closure which might be raised in litigation cases. So they hired an independent company to review the terminated smoking and health project. The company produced this document, the Brubaker Report, a secret until we obtained a copy. Brubaker didn't conclude the laboratories had been closed down because of unfavorable results from the smoking and health research. However, he did reveal that these important programs were stopped prematurely. Brubaker also disclosed ominously that in initial studies to monitor the effect of smoking on rabbits, four to six Winston filter kings inhaled for six to seven months produce emphysema-like changes in the lungs of rabbits. This evidence was not welcome news for the tobacco industry, and the results remain suppressed. When you look back now on the way in which your laboratories were closed down, do you, do you find that strange at all? Yeah, normally when research is being conducted, you don't terminate instantaneously. You allow research projects generally to wind down and final reports to be written. That was not done in this case. Research was terminated immediately. And contrary to all scientific practice, it seems some of the animals were mysteriously terminated too. Half a dozen valuable laboratory rabbits gorged with cigarette smoke went missing just before the laboratory was shut down. Lawyer Bruce Cook, keeping fit for battles with the American tobacco industry, represented a smoker who sued R.J. Reynolds earlier this year. Cook discovered that a handful of mouse house rabbits had vanished. The rabbits should have been killed, then their organs investigated for smoking damage. Cook tried desperately without success to find out what fate had befallen them. Well, I, I think that, that one, uh, that it's only reasonable to conclude that, that these rabbits were in fact sacrificed, that, that they found out that long-term smoking um, caused lung cancer in rabbits. And uh, if they released that, of course, they couldn't go around and say, well, it's never been proven. Is it not a, a, a responsibility of the scientists to, to write the bottom line to the report at some stage? And shouldn't that document be available to you? Well, it clearly, it clearly has to exist, and it's clearly been suppressed or destroyed. 
The decision to close the mouse house was taken as tobacco industry lawyers were becoming increasingly nervous that their clients might score an own goal with their own research. I think the company's lawyers felt that the type of work we were doing was potentially damaging to the company itself. And policy was that that would not happen. And that was the legal department's policy. You were a senior man here. Can you think of any benign reason why this work was so abruptly shut down? None at all. None at all. They found out too much. And all of a sudden, somebody realized that these scientists were discovering that cigarette smoking not only exposed people to a risk of lung cancer, but also heart disease, which had not been the subject of much um, um, publicity at that time, other cancers, emphysema, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, they found out too much. And so what did they do? They fired him. R.J. Reynolds denied these allegations, but they've never published the research. So why was the industry behaving in such a furtive way? The answer was indeed lawyers, hired by the cigarette manufacturers to protect them against possible lawsuits from smokers. But which lawyers, and where? The trail eventually led here to Kansas City in these offices of Shook, Hardy, Ottman, Mitchell and Bacon, one of the nation's leading product liability law firms. It was among the dry rustle of law reports, rather than the industry's scientific research laboratories, that the real policies on smoking and health were formulated. Now, the lawyers don't want to talk to us because they say that any comment would interfere with their strategy of continuing litigation. But we do have some idea of what happened in here during those crucial years. By 1970, against the very real background of possible litigation by smokers, always the plaintiffs, against the tobacco industry, the defendants, David Hardy, one of America's top product liability lawyers, gave advice to the Brown Williamson Tobacco Corporation, advice which was to have a profound influence on the whole industry's strategy for conducting its own research into smoking and ill health. Secret until now, this is what the lawyers said. A plaintiff would be greatly benefited by evidence which tended to establish actual knowledge on the part of the defendant that smoking is generally dangerous to health, that certain ingredients are dangerous and should be removed, or that smoking causes a particular disease. The letter went on to warn that not only could the industry face compensatory, that's comparatively low damages, but a court might regard the industry's previous knowledge of these facts as evidence of willfulness or recklessness sufficient to support a claim for punitive damages. For the industry, the implications were clear. Admission of the truth as they already knew it could be disastrous. One dramatic line says it all. I can anticipate rulings which would leave us defeated by our own hand. And just in case this message is lost, the letter concludes with a dire warning that was to shake the tobacco industry out of any lingering intentions to publish too many awkward scientific truths about its product. In conclusion, I would like to emphasize that in our opinion, the effect of testimony by employees or documentary evidence from industry files which seems to acknowledge or tacitly admit that cigarettes cause cancer or other disease would likely be fatal to the defense in a smoking and health case. The lawyers had spoken, but the companies could no longer square this advice with a 1954 Frank statement, that promise to make paramount the public interest of its own investigation into smoking and health. Now the tobacco industry had to deceive to survive. Top lawyer Robert Wald, he worked for a major tobacco company for 11 years. But I am really under the gun on this other project. Would it be okay? He saw for himself how David Hardy, the author of that warning letter, became an increasingly influential figure within the industry. David Hardy was the most important non-tobacco employee in the industry, I would say. He was the prime architect of the uh, defense of, uh, of uh, liability suits for the tobacco industry. And he had uh, great, uh, not only prominence in the industry, but great, uh, great respect within the industry. David was the guru. The tobacco industry listened carefully to its lawyers. It made sure it never publicly acknowledged the close association between smoking 
and ill health. Instead, a 1972 confidential tobacco industry memorandum praises its own brilliantly conceived strategy, which included creating doubt about the health charge without actually denying it. Future Tactics recommended finding alternatives to smoking as the cause of ill health. There are millions of people who would be receptive to such a message. That strategy, with its overtones of dirty tricks, has held good to this day. I think there's no question, uh, in my opinion, that the tobacco industry has had a brilliant, concerted strategy to misinform and sow the seeds of doubt among the, in, with the public regarding the health effects of smoking. And depends on how you define conspiracy, to me it comes very close. An example of one of the shabbier operations run by the Council for Tobacco Research took place here in New England. They deliberately set out to massage the results of their own research work when it posed a danger to the tobacco industry. Swiss cancer specialist Freddy Homberger was funded by the council to conduct animal research into smoking and cancer. It was 1972 and Homberger was at the cutting edge of this work. We had a method to show, first of all, that in mammalians there is a relation between cancer and smoking, and secondly, gave us for the first time a method to evaluate the degree to which cigarettes smoke was carcinogenic, cancer-producing. Whichever way you look at it, this could not have been good news for the tobacco industry. Hardly. The CTR publicly guarantees its scientists complete scientific freedom and independence. But this news made the council dispatch Ed Jacobs, one of its top lawyers, 500 miles from New York to New England to have a little chat to Dr. Homberger about those research discoveries. They brought up the subject of having stated that, that I had caused cancer in an animal by smoking cigarettes like humans do, and that they wouldn't want me to publish that. That was the beginning. Then we talked back and forth, and they said, well, if you didn't call it cancer, but pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia, which to me was a nonsensical concept, then we might accept that you publish it. And finally, we agreed, well, we, I had to agree because they, that Mr. Jacobs said, if you don't do this, you will never get a penny from the Council for Tobacco Research, which was a very serious threat. They threatened you. And I was sure they would do that. In the end, Homberger courageously defied the threats and published details of his important discovery that smoking caused animal cancer. He used the right word. But even then, the CTR still wouldn't give up. It was the custom that after papers with new stuff coming out, there would be a press conference. And I had been told to go to a certain hotel room to find the press. And I went there, and there was nobody there. And I felt, well, there is just a mix-up. And I forgot about it. Until many years later, when I was a witness called to testify in a trial in New Jersey, the lawyer for the plaintiff had found a confidential memorandum of a cigarette company, public relation man, gloating over the fact that they had sabotaged my press conference. Now, the man who you say gloated is Mr. Leonard Zahn, yes? Yes. Leonard Zahn was then and remains now the chief public relations officer for the CTR. In a memorandum outlining how he pulled this dirty trick, he confided to his boss, I had expressed fears as to what Homburger might try to do with his scheduled paper. He was to tell the press that the tobacco industry was attempting to suppress important scientific information about the harmful effects of smoking. He was going to point specifically at CTR. This was disturbing news. Homburger undoubtedly would have attracted considerable press attention. Zahn arranged to cancel the scheduled press conference, thus killing any publicity. He ended his memo. I doubt if you will want to retain this note. The organization and policy statement of the CTR says uh, quite clearly here that the council awards research grants to independent scientists who are assured complete scientific freedom in conducting their studies. True or untrue? You read now from a recent statement, yes. then it is a lie. 
£120,000 of air-cured tobacco leaf is being auctioned at just over a pound a pound. There's even some ritual deception here. The auctioneer winds up a hypnotic sales chant, then quickly leads his buyers through the tobacco mounds to prevent close inspection of the leaf. That's a tradition, but some things do change. Here, even the people who grow, sell and buy tobacco have now stopped using it. Do you smoke yourself? No. Why? It's the same reason no one else does, I guess. That's for your health. That's for your health. Would you recommend it to other people? Of course not. You wouldn't? No. Why? Uh, it's... It's got a lot of things wrong with it. Do you smoke yourself? Uh, Come on, be honest, be honest. Uh, I don't right now. Ironically, 20 years ago, tobacco could have held its appeal and saved lives if the industry had had the courage to properly market safer cigarettes. There were various types, all revolutionary forms of cigarettes with the lethal contents lessened. We added certain chemical materials to the tobacco and thereby the smoke was decreased in activity and, and did not produce cancers on mouse skin. You tested it on mouse skins? That was the method of testing, yes. And you got no result at all? We got no cancers. You must have been very excited when that happened. We certainly were. Yeah. <laughs> we had spent a good deal of time, as you may know, working on this and uh, it was a success. It was called the XA Project and took Liggett and Myers a quarter of a century to develop a cigarette that virtually eliminated the carcinogens from tobacco smoke. The very fact that they invested so heavily in the Safer Smoke Project was evidence that they were aware of the serious problems with their conventional brands. And in Britain too, tobacco companies' research had also led to the production of a new kind of tobacco called NSM, New Smoking Material. This was an artificial tobacco which, when mixed with a real thing, held out the promise to smokers of the pleasure of the addiction without all the pain. The most sophisticated safer cigarette was R.J. Reynolds' Premier. Research and development costing $300 million went into the product and another fortune was spent in this promotion for the launch. It looks like a cigarette, but at this end, there's a fiberglass insulator around this piece of carbon. And I'll just show you what the charcoal uh, looks like if you, it draws out very nicely here. And looks like a biro pen. What is it? Well, this is a piece of charcoal that has holes drilled in it so that you can draw air through it through this aluminum cylinder. And inside this cylinder are little beads that are soaked with, with nicotine and glycerin. And the beads uh, then heat up when people smoke these things. And the nicotine comes off of the beads into the aerosol, and people then can suck it in. But having taken these major steps towards protecting the health of their consumers, the whole industry then turned to its lawyers for marketing guidance. Uh, the lawyers entered about the time that the uh, request from management came to produce a marketable cigarette. And the first step that they took was to require that all meetings be attended by a legal representative, that all reports be directed to the legal department, and uh, everything be classified as confidential and uh, attorney-client privilege. The most potent example of legal nervousness came from Shook, Hardy and Bacon, by now in their expensive new offices in Kansas City. Their view on the way Premier was being handled effectively guaranteed the death of the whole project. This Shook, Hardy, Bacon internal memorandum reveals their growing concern about the marketing of the new product. The document highlights the chronic legal dilemma for the cigarette manufacturers, namely that this safer cigarette could by default point up the health hazards of the conventional cigarettes 
and then leave manufacturers vulnerable to swinging damages. The breakthroughs touted by Reynolds with respect to this product arguably concede certain shortcomings of their existing products. There are obvious implications in the defense of product liability, smoking, and health suits. The pending and future industry litigation may be adversely affected by this move. Now that theme is repeated time and again in the long memorandum. Put bluntly, the word safer could spell huge legal problems. Even the euphemistic use of the word cleanest in the launch of Premier by Reynolds boss Ed Horrigan made the lawyers shudder. Here's the actual moment. Simply put, we think this will be the world's cleanest cigarette. Several of Horrigan's statements, although carefully worded, came perilously close to being health claims about the product and approached admissions on issues raised in pending or future litigation. In Britain, where the safer cigarettes were also known as NTM, non-tobacco materials, similar problems had surfaced. In 1976, British American Tobacco sought product liability advice about NTM and safer cigarettes. In the course of his opinion, their barrister gave this point-blank warning. All assertions that NTM is safe, or even safer, should be avoided, not least because of the subsidiary implication that tobacco is not safe, or less safe. From now on, and for the sake of one key word, the safe cigarette on both sides of the Atlantic was doomed. It would be launched and marketed, but it could never be advertised as safer. Smokers, even when the news was good for them, were never told the truth. People didn't like it very much. It tasted awful. And Reynolds couldn't advertise its chief advantage, namely that it was less hazardous, because their lawyers wouldn't let them. And why smoke a product that's not as enjoyable as what you're used to when the company won't tell you that it's better for you? Here in the United States Patents Office in Washington, we've unearthed several new inventions since Premier, which may look like cigarettes and may taste like cigarettes, but these documents conspicuously avoid that word. Instead, they use euphemisms like simulated smoking device, flavor delivery article, or how about smoking articles utilizing electrical energy. In fact, they all supposedly refer to safer cigarettes. But here's the problem. Even if they are, you still can't buy them. No safer cigarettes, but consumers are subjected to the PR from the Manhattan office of the Council for Tobacco Research as it artfully disguises the truth. It promises to pour millions into research on tobacco use and health, but even this is just another clever deception. We are currently doing it. For example, a couple of oncogenes are in the line... That Professor Michael Brennan, President Emeritus of the Michigan Cancer Foundation. He's a distinguished member of the Independent Scientific Advisory Board appointed by CTR to dole out tobacco industry cash each year. The money is supposed to seek answers to the alleged controversies about tobacco use and ill health, but once again CTR is cheating. How much of CTR's work is specifically related to the investigation of the relationship between smoking and ill health? Very little in the years that I've been on the board, uh, in this sense. Very, when you say very little, how yeah. little? I don't believe that uh, a tenth of the funds awarded, uh, certainly less than a tenth of the funds awarded, are, um, are awarded for the specific study of tobacco related effects. If you look at their annual reports all the way back, you find very, very little that deals with the induction of cancer by smoking and a lot of things on other related or unrelated subjects. And I think that's what their task was and that's what they did. They're a propaganda arm of the, to of the tobacco industry. We've uh, uh, tried to monitor their activities, and we're unaware of any of their uh, studies that has uh, made any difference in uh, the issue of tobacco or health uh, in this country or anywhere. Although little of its work now involves smoking and health, the industry has recruited many distinguished scientists for its scientific advisory board. It's good public relations. 
The scientists, in turn, are only too happy to divert tobacco profits to important non-smoking projects, and, of course, none of them is fooling themselves about the dangers of smoking. Professor Brennan, um, you believe there is a relationship between smoking and cancer and ill health? Yes, I do. How many of your colleagues on the Scientific Advisory Board believe that? Everyone. Well, what do you say about all the distinguished names that do comprise the Scientific Advisory Board? Are these men uh, crooks? Are they naive? Are they jejeun or what? No, my, my impression is that they're very naive. I think many of them are quite genuine in thinking they're performing a useful service to the scientific community. I don't think they appreciate the extent to which they are being used by the tobacco industry and the extent to which they are lending their names to the perpetuation of smoking and tobacco-related death. No one in the tobacco industry has cooperated with Panorama. Even the normally publicity-conscious Council for Tobacco Research on the fourth floor of this skyscraper was overcome by shyness when it came to talking to us. He says no. He says no what? No can do it. No can do what? So, you are saying formally now that I am not allowed to go to the office of the Council for Tobacco Research. You are forbidding me entry as a valid journalist. I'm not allowed to go up there. That's what you are saying. That's what he said. At first, it seemed as if the bashful Leonard Zahn, grand master of the dirty trick to sabotage Freddy Homburger's press conference, would stay in hiding. But safe on the telephone inside, he did make a contribution. Who is that? This is Mr. Zahn. Oh, hello, Mr. Zahn. It's Tom Mangold of BBC Television here. Uh, we're trying to get access to your office, but for some reason the security guards won't let us into the building. Could you uh, authorize them to let us in? No, I'm afraid I can't. But uh, you are the public relations officer for CTR. Yes, I am. And in that sense, I'd very much like to talk to you and pick up a copy of your annual report. I'd be happy to give you a copy of the annual report. And can I also do a short interview with you? No, I'm afraid not. But you are the man designated to talk to the press, yes, are you? I am. And why won't you talk to BBC Television? Because the council has nothing to say in this matter, Mr. Mangold. But you don't know what my questions are yet, Mr. Zahn. It does not matter. It doesn't matter what questions I have for you. That's right. You won't answer them. That's right. Is that so because you have a few things that you wish to hide? Okay, well, we are out. They won't let us in, so if you come outside to the uh, sidewalk, that's where we are now. All right. Thanks, Mr. Zahn. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Well, hopefully he's coming down. Well, sadly, uh, Mr. Zahn wasn't quite as good as his word. He came down, but he declined to uh, come out onto the pavement here. He has left an envelope. Uh, we're not really any wiser at all, but at least we tried. One question Mr. Zahn might have addressed was the creation of a secret special projects division within the council. Yeah. Dr. John Kreischer was the CTR's associate director for 12 years and saw for himself the development of this strange and unpublicized offshoot which handled carefully selected studies from the CTR's research program. I'll walk over you, here. you must realize that Special projects were not under CTR. They were under the corporate councils, and they were a separate satellite. If you have CTR here, you have corporate council here. There was some interaction in the fact that they used us for a resource base, what information is known in this field, and so forth. But it was strictly under their own management. It was lawyer-driven. It was lawyer-driven. They were up 10 floors, and we were not allowed to go up there. And, Why not? Uh, because that was their corporate library, which was also the resource for legal counsel uh, handling legal suits. And this was their resource to get information. Uh, so well, those were handled under a different uh, management system. Well, who did go up there? The corporate counsel were the sole uh, individuals that were... Well, you told you were not allowed to go up there. Oh, yes, very distinctly. Special projects is a particularly disturbing aspect of a very disturbing public relations device. Special projects is taking the notion of an independent scientific funding mechanism and just completely subverting it. The special projects said that lawyers would now be in charge of the science rather than the scientists who are ostensibly in charge of most of the CTR activity.
Dr. Carol Henry is a scientist who clashed with the lawyers. She was sponsored by the CTR to do a rare relevant study on smoking and health. In a huge project, she investigated the relationship between smoking and different types of cancer in mice. The results, while not conclusive for humans, were ominous for the tobacco industry. Well, we felt it was extremely important. Uh, it was one of the first, if not the first, study to, to show that cigarette smoke could cause an increase in lung cancers in animals. We felt that it was a pioneering study. But after completion of her work, the studies were hijacked by special projects who needed to add their spin to the news. Dr. Henry's carefully worded judgments were at the heart of her work. But when the tobacco industry produced an expensive book and a press release detailing the studies, Dr. Henry's crucial interpretations were deliberately left out. There was some bad news for the industry in your report. Yes. And it's not in this book. Right. All the good news is. Uh, yes. <laughs> were you involved in the press release? No, I, I did not know anything about a press release. Uh, so they published once again a summary of your work, but only the good news for the industry. Well, the, the, again, uh, this was, uh, they were the contractor, the people funding the contract, and they had total control over how they chose to treat the data. Does the word manipulation come to your mind? <laughs> a little bit. When the industry was being sued by a smoker dying of cancer, special projects took all Dr. Henry's data but dropped her carefully worded conclusions, so seriously distorting her work. Do you think that the tobacco industry was being ethical in using your study in the way that it did? Um, I'm not very happy about it. Uh, I certainly would never have used the study to say that cig cigarette smoke did not cause cancer in humans. I think that, that you, one cannot say that. Lawyers are now controlling what research is done and because of the structure of special projects they get to decide whether the results of that research become public. Now what that means is that if the research is favorable to them they can use it for their defense purposes and if the research is not favorable, they can bury it. Morning, Jackie. But not everything can be hidden. This is the Honorable H. Lee Sarakin, a United States District Court judge. While he was presiding over a tobacco litigation case last year, he examined some highly confidential tobacco industry documents in camera to assess whether they could be published. What the judge spotted in these secrets of the tobacco industry made him very angry. Sarakin was contemptuously dismissive of the real motives behind the formation of the CTR. A jury might reasonably conclude that the industry's announcement of proposed independent research into the dangers of smoking and its promise to disclose its findings was nothing but a public relations ploy, a fraud. Sarakin noted that when he'd reviewed some of the secret documents, they spoke for themselves in a voice filled with disdain for the consuming public and its health. Sarakin's conclusions on the behavior of the tobacco industry were unambiguous. All too often in the choice between health and profit, concealment is chosen over disclosure, sales over safety, and money over morality. Who are these persons who knowingly and secretly decide to put the buying public at risk solely for the purpose of making profits, and who believe that illness and death of consumers is an appropriate cost of their own prosperity? The tobacco industry may be the king of concealment and disinformation. Sarakin's explicitness brought him a reprimand for the appearance of bias, and he was invited to relinquish the case. But the judge remains unchastened. Indeed, it was his use of the single word fraud in his now famous opinion which has led the federal investigators to start their inquiry into what is actually being peddled by the cigarette manufacturers. People know smoking's bad for you, but they don't know how bad it is. And the industry has played a beautiful role in making sure that they don't understand how bad it is. One-fifth of all the people who die prematurely in Britain die because they have smoked cigarettes. Health workers now acknowledge that as long as the tobacco industry maintains the phony controversy, then each new generation will need to be freshly educated against this lethal addiction. 
There's no other product in this entire universe that I'm aware of that causes the magnitude of suffering and of death that's associated with smoking. The tobacco industry is really the only one that attempts to perpetuate a myth that there's any scientific doubt anymore. Do I detect that, that they have lied, cheated, deceived, uh, done everything to ensure that the people who quit are replaced by 13 and 14 year old future smokers? Yes, I do. Youth is convinced of its own immortality, yet those who are older and wiser still promote and sell openly a powerful and addictive drug that kills and injures. So tomorrow's victims, a little foolish but also betrayed, are already gambling with their future, encouraged by a tobacco industry unwilling and perhaps now incapable of telling the truth. <laughs>